Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Man's Dark Imagination. I am your host, Alan Gotro. Uh, tonight, we're going to examine a case that before recently had not been well known. I even wrote an article about it in 1991, and back then, not a lot of people knew about it. It concerns a city that loves parties, loves jazz, and loves the reputation of preserving life. But in the years 1918 to 1919, a dark, mysterious, and some people thought supernatural force visited the city with a vicious abandon. He taunted police and the citizenry alike and escaped detection. No one, not even children, could escape his deadly grasp. As the United States entered World War I in Europe, the citizens of the country waved goodbye to sons, husbands, and loved ones on their way to the Western Front to fight for democracy. In New Orleans, even with the uncertainty of returning young men from the front, the city enjoyed an economic boom demonstrated in these old motion pictures. The life in the Big Easy seemed a welcome distraction from the war. But among the nighttime shadows of the city, a killer surfaced who demanded appeasement from the residents of New Orleans. This killer proved dastardly, diabolical, sociopathic, and psychotic. He held the city hostage for over 18 months, but those who tried to catch him never realized that his crimes may have gone back more than eight years before. The dark days of the Axe Man still generate a morbid fascination with the macabre and foment fear amongst the locals who first hear of the reign of terror of the serial killer for the first time. The world will continue to see the brutality of such attacks and even worse as the allure of serial murder would permeate the human psyche. The beginning of the Axeman's reign of terror occurred at approximately 4.30 a.m. on the morning of May 23, 1918. A low moaning sound roused Jake Maggio from a sound sleep. When Jake arose from his bed, he awoke his other brother, Andrew, who had been sleeping off a drunken stupor where he was celebrating being called into the service of his country. Jake and Andrew stumbled through the house located at 4901 Magnolia Street in Midtown, New Orleans. And when they opened the door to the room that their brother Joseph shared with his wife Catherine, the two men shrieked in horror. Catherine and Joseph lay in a pool of blood on the bed. Catherine lay groaning with a large gash on the side of her head. Joseph, with the same wounds, was dead. Jake and Andrew immediately called for the police and an ambulance to assist with Mrs. Maggio. She later died of her wounds. Captain John Drum was the first watch commander to arrive on the scene and noticed that an empty strong box lay opened on the bedroom floor. Captain Drum surmised that the Maggios had been victims of a robbery gone badly. Captain Drum also noticed that one of the bottom panels of the back door adjacent to the Maggio's bedroom had been chiseled out. Drum further surmised that more witnesses should have come forward due to the loud banging it would have taken to loosen the panel to break into the house. Dr. Joseph O'Hara, the coroner for Orleans Parish, determined that the Maggio succumbed to, quote, external and internal hemorrhages of the head and brain, end quote. Additionally, it appeared that both victims suffered from their throats being cut with a razor. Later that day, two New Orleans detectives, Theodore Obitz and Harry Dodson, stumbled across a chalk message in the sidewalk near the murder scene. The cryptic writing stated, quote, Mrs. Maggio is going to sit up late tonight just like Mrs. Tony, end quote. The message did not appear to make sense to either of the gumshoes, but they copied down the exact wording anyway. Andrew and Jake Maggio were arrested and brought to the 7th District Police Station for questioning. Despite being hungover and barely coherent, Andrew Maggio withstood the incessant questioning from police after they discovered the razor used to slice the throats of Joseph and Catherine belonged to the slowly sobering Andrew. The police later released the two brothers but a rumor circulated throughout the city that the Mafia was involved in the Maggio murder. Subsequently, authorities learned that something more diabolical was afoot. On the morning of June 28, 1918, a baker by the name of John Zanka walked up to the door of Dorgenois and La Harpe Streets, where he was to make a delivery at the grocery store run by Louis Bessemer. 
When Zanka received no response from his knocking on the front door, he went to the side alley to try that entranceway. Zanka noticed in the dimly lit alley that one of the panels on the bottom door appeared to be missing. Zanka prepared to knock again when suddenly Louis Bessemer opened the door with blood running down his face from a gash in his head. Bessemer claimed that the Axeman had visited he and his mistress, Harriet Lowe, in the middle of the night and wounded her badly as well. When police arrived, they noticed a pool of blood, but no Harriet. She received her wounds at one spot and then dragged herself to the bedroom where she lay unconscious. In the bathroom, the police discovered a bloody axe leaning against one of the walls of the tub. Diluted blood and water stood in the bottom of that tub. On the following day, Authorities chose to approach the Bessemer case with a slight difference from the Maggio's. While looking for clues to the attack on Bessemer and Lowe, the police discovered letters Bessemer had written in German and Yiddish. Authorities deduced that Bessemer was a German spy and involved the federal authorities. The Bessemer attack proved to be a red herring and had nothing to do with the Axeman whatsoever. Louis Bessemer even requested that he be allowed to investigate his own case. Miss Lowe recovered and it turned out to be just a lover's quarrel that turned violent. Because detectives advocated that the Bessemer case had Axeman signatures, Police Superintendent Frank Mooney demoted two detectives. The city remained free from any nocturnal attacks, at least until August 5th. Mrs. Edward Schneider lay in her bed resting on that muggy August night. Her husband worked nights and left her alone with their three children while he performed his job duties. As she lay on the bed nine months pregnant, her three children slept in the next room. When she opened her eyes briefly, she noticed a dark figure standing over her. The figure then struck her with something in the face, knocking out two front teeth and rendering her unconscious. Once the police brought her to the charity hospital, Mrs. Schneider regained consciousness and became hysterical, believing that she would lose her baby. The trauma of the attack caused her to go into labor. When the child was born, there were no effects from the attack and both baby and mother recovered from the excitement. After an extensive search of the house, detectives discovered the axe missing from the family's tool shed. Five days later, police were called to the residence of another grocer, Joseph Romano. When they arrived, the authorities found the lifeless and bloody body of the grocer slash barber. The police found no evidence suggesting the identity of the perpetrator, but two witnesses, Pauline, aged 18, and her sister, Mary, aged 13, lay in bed trying to sleep and heard nothing of the attack on their uncle. Pauline stated that she awoke at approximately 3 a.m. and saw what she thought to be the shadow of a tall man standing near her door. Just then, her uncle, Mr. Romano, stumbled into the girl's room and appeared to be dazed with blood running from a deep wound in the scalp. Romano then went into the next room and slumped into the chair where he stated, quote, something has happened, my head hurts, call for an ambulance. The Axeman had attacked two families and left three dead in his wake. Police tried desperately to determine what type of individual could have been responsible for the terror. Detective John D'Antonio, an experienced investigator who worked on the Walter LaManna murder case some 11 years before, sought to identify the characteristics of the killer in an interview to the local newspapers. I am convinced the man is of a dual personality and it's very probable that he is the man we tried so hard to get 10 years ago when a series of acts and butcher knife murders was committed within a few months. My opinion is based on experience and a study of criminology. Criminals such as the ones like the Axe Man are on the order of Jack the Ripper, who some years ago terrorized London. They are cunning and hard to catch. I have never known the Mafia to kill women. In fact, you could not get a Mafia agent to murder a woman under any circumstances. The attacks that Detective D'Antonio referenced occurred between 1910 and 1917. In the early morning hours of August 14, 1910, Mr. August Crudy and his wife settled in for the night in the apartment above their grocery store, located at the corner of Les Epps and Royal Streets. Crudy often suffered from an upset stomach, and in the early morning hours of the 14th, Crudy awoke after laying down for approximately a half an hour. Crudy got out of bed and walked to the backyard of the residence in the hopes that the night air would relieve his discomfort. He returned to the bed next to his wife and fell asleep at approximately 1 a.m. At approximately 3 a.m., Mrs. Crudy awoke to find a large dark figure standing next to her bed holding what appeared to be a meat cleaver. The figure demanded money and Mrs. Crudy obliged the demand. 
Mrs. Crudy asked for her husband, she then shook August and when he turned over, bled from massive gashes in his head. When August tried to raise himself up from the bed, the assailant struck him again with the cleaver and Mr. Crudy fell off the bed with the force of the blow. The attacker fled soon after the strike. Surprisingly, August Crudy recovered from his wounds, but never forgot the actions from that night. Police had no leads as to the mysterious assailant. Five weeks later, on September 21st, 1910, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Rosetto, who owned a grocery store at the corner of London and Tontai Avenues, suffered a brutal attack by a mysterious stranger, and police thought once they made it to the scene of the incident, the Rosettos would not survive. Fortunately, the Rosettos did survive the attack and would later reunite in the hospital. Again, the police had no leads or suspects. For over a year, the city remained quiet regarding the phantom assailant. Then, on September 21st, 1911, Joseph Davi and his wife were attacked when they slept in the small apartment they owned behind their grocery and bar room at 2425 Galvez Street. The first blow struck Mr. Davi over the head and fractured his skull. Mrs. Davi received deep cuts on her nose and hands. Mr. Davi later succumbed to his wounds, and Mrs. Davi stated that, quote, she would devote the balance of her life to find the murderer or murderers of her husband, end quote. Even averring to find the killers, Mrs. Davi could not identify the assailant or assailants that killed her husband. The killer remained silent for eight months and then, on May 12, 1912, Corporal George Duffy of the 5th Precinct received a telephone call from a Fred Stegelmeyer who resided at 4212 Villaray Street. Stegelmeyer claimed to the young officer that he heard gunshots coming from a bar room owned by Anthony J. Shamrock and his wife, Johanna, at the corner of France and Villaray Streets. Corporal Duffy proceeded to the Shamrock residence, and when he opened the door to the residence behind the bar room, he found Anthony Shamrock nude with gunshot wounds to the back. His wife, Johanna, lay unconscious from a gunshot wound to the hip. Corporal Duffy tried to question Mrs. Shambra when she could barely sustain consciousness, but she could not identify the assailant. Anthony Shambra died at the scene. Mrs. Shambra died from her wounds a few days later. Almost five years later, on Saturday morning, December 22, 1917, Epitano and Delina and his two sons, John and Salvador, suffered from wounds they sustained during a hatchet attack at their residence and place of business at 8301 Apple Street. Mrs. Andalina first saw the intruder and gave the alarm with a loud scream, alerting the others to the presence of a stranger standing near the foot of her bed. The assailant struck Mr. Andalina in the head, and when his sons intervened, they received wounds as well. The intruder then escaped. No one could give a credible description of the assailant, and the Andalina survived the attack. When D'Antonio reminded the populace of the city of the previous murders, Superintendent of Police Frank Mooney began in earnest to find the killer. He studied the previous cases and noticed that the killings escalated in ferocity. With no other leads to follow, the police had nothing to do but wait until another attack occurred. This would never be more certain. In an effort to allay the fears of the residents of New Orleans, on August 19, 1918, a local supermarket used the murders to advertise specials at their store. Although indeed in bad taste, the newspaper advertisement displayed the morbid sense of humor used as a coping mechanism by the citizens of the city. The new year passed without much fanfare, but on March 9, 1919, the Axeman struck again. On the west bank of the Mississippi River in the hamlet known as Gretna, Louisiana, Charles Cordemiglia normally opened his grocery store at the corner of Jefferson and 2nd Streets at approximately 5 o'clock in the morning. Hazel Jackson, a neighbor of the Cordemiglia family, tried to get someone to answer the door, but to no avail. Jackson then went to the side alley and knocked there. She noticed that a chair was under the bedroom window where Mr. and Mrs. Cordemiglia slept. Jackson also noticed that the back door had one of its panels missing. Jackson ran from the house, then immediately notified the police. When authorities arrived at the Cordemiglia residence, they found the lifeless body of two-year-old Mary Cordemiglia. Mr. and Mrs. Cordemiglia had been attacked after their little girl, but they still clung to life. Mrs. Cordemiglia cried uncontrollably for her deceased child. 
When police located the bloody axe used on the court of Miglias under the front steps of their house, little clumps of hair and brains were discovered on the blade. While at the hospital, Mrs. Cordomiglia identified a 17-year-old neighbor, Orlando Gugliardo, as her assailant. Gugliardo's father, 69-year-old Orlando Gugliardo Sr., was also identified as an accomplice. Mrs. Cordomiglia used to work with Mr. Gugliardo and left his employ to start a business of her own across the street. Mrs. Cordomiglia convinced her husband to start another business in order to put the Gugliardos out of business. Subsequently, the two men stood trial and were found guilty, but later Mrs. Cordomiglia had an epiphany and decided to tell the truth about the Gugliardos, recanting her accusations against the father and son. They were immediately released and the charges against them dropped. To add further mystique to the identity of the killer, on March 16, 1919, the local newspaper, the Times-Picayune, received a cryptic letter that appeared to taunt the police. The letter read, Hell, March 13, 1919, esteemed mortal of New Orleans, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axe Man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, be smeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rustle my jimmies. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but as satanic majesty Francis Joseph. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the great Axeman. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in my nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz man is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going well, then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. My axe. Deuces. The axe man. Examination of the note in present day terms would most certainly have been discounted. Although serial killers seek to inject themselves into the investigation and draw attention to the outwitting of the police, this letter mentions no details of the crimes which only the killer could have been aware. Secondly, it would appear that the supernatural being referring to himself as the Axeman is following in the footsteps of a bloody mentor, Jack the Ripper. The former not only wrote letters to the press about his crimes and taunted the police, but also allegedly left a mysterious message after his fourth murder that, even to this day, historians argue as to its meaning. This leaves the Mrs. Tony message scrawled on the sidewalk, not too far from the Maggio murder scene, to leave investigators and historians alike to ponder the demented ramblings of a psychopath. In demanding that the city's inhabitants fill the air with jazz music on the night of the killer's choosing, a city gripped in fear hoped to appease the murderer. A further effort to make sure that the killer would pass over the residents playing his favorite music John Joseph de Vila wrote a special ditty entitled The Mysterious Axe Man's Jazz, or Papa Don't Scare Me. 
Other musicians reviewed the piece with comical criticism, as the playful piece was composed during the bloody aspects of the crimes being committed. Exactly as the Axeman demanded, every home played jazz music on March 19, 1919, in the hopes that the demon would not visit their home that night. The Times Picayune printed a cartoon lampooning the night of jazz. While the family sat around the piano and made merry, a young mother could be seen at the window casting her watch over her family. The danger was real, and the people of New Orleans took the threat from the phantom seriously. The city experienced a temporary reprieve from the murders that night. That reprieve only lasted until the end of the summer of that year. On August 3, 1919, Sarah Lowland, a young, vivacious 19-year-old girl, felt a paralyzing boom on her head as she slept. When she awoke, she suffered a gaping wound in her head and managed to scare off her intruder. The assailant attempted to make his way into the Lauman residence through a window and not through a panel in the door. Miss Lauman recovered from her wounds. At approximately 1.45 a.m. on October 27, 1919, the Axeman claimed his alleged last victim. Jefferson Parish Deputy Ben Corcoran was walking home after a long shift at the station when 11-year-old Rosie Pepitone ran into the middle of the street and began screaming that her father had been attacked. Deputy Corcoran asked the little girl to show him where she lived, and when the two arrived at the Pepitone residence, Deputy Corcoran spoke with Esther Pepitone, the victim's wife. Mrs. Pepitone went into the bedroom, followed by the deputy. Deputy Corcoran examined Mike Pepitone as he lay on the bed, bleeding profusely from a gaping wound in his head. Mrs. Pepitone then said to the police officer, quote, it looks like the axe man was here and murdered Mike, end quote. An ambulance soon arrived and rushed the bleeding man to the charity hospital. Mike Pepitone later succumbed to his wounds. Instead of the assailant using an axe, this time he used an iron bar with a large bolt at the end of it. Other than the utterances of his wife, the police could find no connection between the Pepitone attack and that of the axe man's previous victims. After an intense investigation, police surmised that the attack on Mike Pepitone may have been a revenge killing stemming from his father's association with organized crime a few years later. In 1910, Mike's father, Peter Pepitone, shot and killed a rival grocer by the name of Charles De Cristina. The elder Pepitone stood trial and was convicted of murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Peter Pepitone later received a pardon and released him from Angola State Penitentiary. It may have been a revenge killing for the death of De Cristina, but why wait 10 years to carry out the vendetta? After the attack on the Pepitones, the city of New Orleans breathed a sigh of relief and almost forgot the horrors brought on to the population by the killer. That is, until a newspaper article appeared stating that the mystery of the Axeman had finally been solved. Newspaper headlines from Los Angeles, California stated that Mrs. Esther Albano had shot a man by the name of Joseph Mumphrey who had entered her home uninvited. Mrs. Albano declared that the man demanded money from her and threatened both her and her children if the money were not forthcoming. Police later identified Mrs. Albano as Mrs. Mike Pepitone, the wife of the last alleged victim of the Axeman, Mike Pepitone. After the death of her husband, Mrs. Pepitone traveled to California to attend her niece's wedding. While there, she met Angelo Albano, whom she married a short time later. On October 27, 1921, Esther Albano reported her husband missing. Alerted relatives traveled to Los Angeles to help with the search. Allegedly, the man calling himself Joseph Mumphrey repeatedly threatened to kill Angelo Albano if some money were not paid. On one particular night, Mumphrey visited the Albano residence and demanded the money. When he leveled threats to Mrs. Albano, she did what she had to do to protect her family. After her arrest and a subsequent trial, Esther Albano was acquitted of all charges. In all, the Axeman claimed eight victims, injuring somewhere between six and ten people. Joseph Mumphrey has been forwarded as the main suspect, but prison records from that time period reflect that Mumphrey had been in prison since 1908 and did not secure release until 1923. So, who was the Axeman? Again, we may never know unless there's an eyewitness account that we have never heard of or a police report where detectives made some sort of assumption. Still, it does send chills down your spine when you realize this man, if he was a man, was never apprehended. 
I'll see you next time on Man's Dark Imagination. <laughs>